You have questions, we have answers. This is Jane Muller. And this is Ken Muller. Welcome to our show, all about real estate with Ken and Jane. And today, Jane, you are outnumbered two to one because there are two <laughs> attorneys present, myself and our very special guest, attorney David Himmelman, who is a land use a zoning expert attorney, among many others. David, welcome to our show. Good morning, Ken and Jane. Thank you so much for having me, and I look excited. Uh, I'm excited to uh, answer some questions and discuss uh, land use law. Yeah. Or would you rather talk about the football and the upcoming draft and the Giants, <laughs> Jets? We can well, talk about that too. You know, it's a sports station. We don't have. We can. We can brighten up. I know it's a dry topic, um, but promise you won't pick on Jane too much. We're two lawyers here against. Uh, hey, uh, Ken. Uh, hey, uh, can I say something? Uh, what you say is not the entire. Uh, Correct, uh, because Mr. David Himmelman uh was my attorney. That's true. So he I was, came you were, here with uh, my attorney today. Uh, <laughs> so be careful, Ken. Whatever you say uh, may may be, you know against you. Yeah. No, Ken. I, I hate to say attorney. this. Yeah. I think Jane's right. Unfortunately, being law- her lawyer is thicker than marriage. That's <laughs> yes, right. That's right. There's certain fiduciary duties of confidentiality, exactly. loyalty, and um, the whole yes. thing trust. And you know you cannot breach that relationship, right? Yeah. So, I feel so so comfortable uh, today. I have my own personal attorney oh, here so with me. He's not going to pick on. Two you. to gonna, one. So you're Two saying, to one. Ken. So he's gonna, all right. There you go. So he's going to defend you. And you know, Jane, you know, Ken. Uh, I have to say, uh, Jane's been saying for years, I don't go anywhere without my personal attorney. And I always thought she was talking about you. But we never go anywhere. <laughs> we never go anywhere. <laughs> so it must be you, right? That's right. Uh, but I. I, on, a, on another uh, note on the sports before we yeah. get into the topic, uh, I've been a season t- ticket holder for the Giants for over 35 years. Right, right. So I've seen the good and I've seen the bad. Right. But every year I wake up before the season starts and I have positive outlook. So that's that keeps us going as season ticket holders. Yes. Right. And, the, and the price going up, too, to pay for and the, the price. They got to yes. pay for the QB, the running back, uh, bring in some more players. So they got to raise the, they got to raise the prices. You know, you got to. We'll have to do more business, right? To well, pay for uh, as Jane knows, talent, he, good talent is not cheap. Right. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> right. There you go. Absolutely. Especially with lawyers, too. Exactly. And you're one you of get the, what you and, pay for. And you're the best, right. All right. So let's. we're going to talk about uh, zoning laws because that's a relevant uh, thing with real estate. And um, uh, no one better than to explain it than somebody who's done that for, for many years. You've appeared as a zoning board attorney for different uh, towns. You've represented many clients and, you know, uh, corporations with zoning issues. So to start with, David, give us some um, level at how zoning laws are adopted uh, so the listeners may not realize that it's on a on the township level. Sure. Um, uh, and again, thank, thank you both for having me. So generally, uh, how are zoning laws enacted? So the, the zoning laws in New Jersey uh, really emanate from the New Jersey Constitution. Um, and that, the power to zone was delegated to the municipalities under the municipal land use law, which was enacted in 1975. And then what happens is uh, the the job to enact zoning laws then goes to the municipalities, and and in some cases regional jurisdictions. Um, and that delegation then is inferred to, as you've indicated, Ken, to various planning and zoning boards who work with the, the local governing bodies to adopt a master plan, which governs how the town is developed and built out uh, according to the master plan. And that master plan can be amended from time to time, and it, and it normally is. So applications then go to the either the planning or the zoning board. We'll get into that a little bit later. And it's those respective boards' job to review the, the applicable zoning laws that's been delegated and approved under the master plan and whether deviations are appropriate or not. And that will depend on uh, applications on a case-by-case basis. So that's generally how the zoning laws in New Jersey have been delegated to, munis- to uh, municipalities yep. to administer. And the concept for a master plan, David, is that you want to you want to put like things in like areas. You don't want commercial next to residential. So that, that's the whole concept of a master plan. You want to put your industrial, your warehouses in one section of a town, your residential in another section. You want to congregate like with like and not so that's the whole concept of a master plan where the zoning uh, people get together and they say well what do we want to put in this section of town what do we, what do we, we want to put in section b and c etc so no question yeah. and if you look at any municipality in new jersey you will see that it's not by accident that residential communities have developed in certain portions of, the, of a municipality or a town or a borough the same with an industrial park or a commercial park 
Uh, and so it's often when you have uh, commercial applications uh, which are coming before a zoning or planning board, which may adjoin one of those other zones, whether it's residential or industrial, where you get into certain issues, and we can talk about that later. But generally, the municipalities have to look and have looked over a period of you know 50 or 60 years as to the best way to develop those areas. And for, for example, like in East Brunswick, where we all live, I mean, Route 18 has been our commercial corridor. Mm -hmm. But Prior to the prior to uh, the development of, of master plans, there were residents that were developed near and adjacent to the highway. Mm. Okay, and if you remember, Route 18 was a single road, one way, right. going each way. So ultimately, you had the East Brunswick Mall, and you had other commercial development, but they literally were were developed against these small homes. So over time, the town had to look at that and deal with those issues. Right. So I guess as times evolve and things change, the plan has to always be revisited and you have to make considerations, right? Because what one what 50 years ago was a one lane country road now is a highway. So if there was a house there that from 80 years ago, obviously that's not going to fit in with the current uh, uh, zoning you know, master plan conception. <laughs> right. And another, another uh, I guess, legislative or statutory authority that the municipalities have is under the New, New Jersey redevelopment law which allows a municipality to look at certain properties that may be the subject of blight or may have or may be underutilized. So in those cases the municipalities can amend its master plan and create a redevelopment plan for particular portions of the town to try and rehabilitate or redevelop those portions and we've seen that obviously throughout the state uh, particularly in Middlesex County where uh, these municipalities use that tool very effectively and can be, can be uh, really a, a, also a financial boom to municipalities because of the, of the ability to generate more taxable rateables. So that's another zoning tool that municipalities now have as well. Um, so if there's a residential home that, that was kind of grandfathered into an area that is now primarily commercial, is there relief, um, monetary relief that the that the owner can get from the township to get like a fair market value to get a buyout? Because obviously, residents in that situation ideally don't want to live in a, an environment. So, would the, do towns have that type of procedure where they could buy out that property? Yeah. So under the under the condemnation, uh, the the eminent domain laws of New Jersey, and also there through the redevelopment law, the municipality has the ability to acquire by eminent domain. A property that they would need in to, I guess, facilitate a redevelopment project. Um, so there has to be a public purpose, though. A municipality can't just uh, a resident just can't can't come to a municipality and say, "Buy out my property because I happen to live now near a commercial area." Oh, I see. So there has to be a public purpose, and the public purpose is normally if they, you know, again, if there's redevelopment, if there's infrastructure projects that have to be built, okay. If there's a highway that has to be constructed, things like that. So in that case, if they if they need to take by eminent domain a particular piece of property, whether it's residential or not, they would have to offer, and it would be appraised by a licensed appraiser, and that would be done based on the fair market value of that property. But again, there has to be a public purpose for that taking. And that happened with uh, in East Brunswick with Route 18, I think, with certain certain uh, properties were taken by eminent domain, and they had to work out of the fair market value of the of the taken property. Right. And oftentimes, what in those cases, the municipalities structure the developer's agreement to encourage the developer to acquire those properties in lieu of condemnation, to try and negotiate the, the purchase of those properties. Because in order to move forward with condemnation, it's an expensive process. It's timely through the courts. So it's better if the parties can negotiate an agreement for the develop, redeveloper or developer or even the town to acquire it without the formal need to file a condemnation litigation. Mm -hmm. But how about if the township, as you said, the, the appraisal, right, the, uh, the, the, the owner of the property disagree with the appraisal? And then what happens? Okay, so in that case, um, if there is a formal condemnation proceeding, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, and the municipality um, has to have the property appraised because they have to put into court, they have to deposit into court the fair market value, what they pr believe pursuant to an expert appraisal report. Yeah. The, the property owner can then get a competing appraisal, 
Mm -hmm. and they can uh, present that as evidence in in the condemnation proceeding. And ultimately, normally the ultimately the judge would decide what what the fair market value is. And oftentimes they will bring in a third party mm -hmm. expert mm -hmm. to be able to render an opinion. And uh, most cases, in, in Jane, in that situation, the, the case settles mm -hmm. somewhere between what the town appraises and, and what and what the property owner's appraisal is. But ultimately, the court would have to make a determination based on the expert opinion of those appraisers. Right, because they would come in and give give testimony. Right, they would they they would they come in. It would be a trial. A trial. So they'd have to then. They can't just rely on their written reports. They have to come in and give oral testimony, and then get get cross examined based on the comps they use. Correct. And maybe the whole you know getting yeah. Into there the there is a there would literally be a trial. So you file a complaint. There's an answer filed. There's discovery. There would be uh, depositions of the experts, and ultimately they would have to testify at trial should the matter not settle. And you're right. And the judge would have to determine the credibility of that expert and make a determination uh, based on their, the expert testimony and the report and the evidence where the, for, where the fair, fair market value lies. And typically, it would be a judge. It would be, it would be a non-jury um, determination. Typically, those, yes. Typically, just In those judge, cases, right? yes. Correct. So it's good to know the judge. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Not to, not to. Well, unfortunately, they're going to they're yeah. going to um, be objective and look at of the course. evidence and they obviously uh, yeah. give weight to the testimony as well. Yes, that's why they're the judge, right? To be yeah. fair, yeah. according to the law, I think a lot of the public like uh, sorry, ourselves. Jane, we're going to go to break, David. Why don't you give your contact information before we take a short break? Sure. So my office is located in East Brunswick, uh, and I'm at 620 Cranberry Road, uh, and actually next to the post office, not far from <laughs> Jane and Ken's office. Uh, and I guess that's sort of Main Street, uh, East Brunswick, it's, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, it's all lawyer, doctor, so you're, right. of course, you're the appropriate But that's spot. where I am, and I've been a resident of East Brunswick for over 30 years and used to be the municipal attorney here as well hey. back in the 90s. Give us your phone number. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's 732 732- 659-6130. All right, great. That's my phone number. We're gonna take a number. Great. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back to our show. Uh, so, David, we were talking about uh, the zoning and the, and the master plan and how, how the zoning um, different areas are, are um, determined, you know, commercial, residential. So what if uh, this is where, I guess, the attorneys come involved in because there's always, if somebody wants to, let's say, put a commercial prop property in a residential area or vice versa, they want to put a, uh, a uh, residential in a commercial area, that, that would, um, it, there, is a, there is a means, a procedure in place for that to be applied for, right? Can you talk a little bit sure. about the variance? Um, so to, uh, thanks for the question, Ken. So just to put this in context, so under the municipal land use law, there are basically two types of variances. There's a devariance, which is, what, what the general public understands is a use variance where the use is not permitted in a particular zone. Then, and there are other devariances, for example, if you exceed the height by 10% or if the density in the zone doesn't permit what you're seeking to, to develop uh, based on the unit uh, acreage requirement. Um, and then there are the C variances, which are do not do not require the same level of proofs. Uh, for example, if there's if you don't meet like the setback requirements or uh, front yard setback, etc. Um, so normally you have to first assess well what type what type of development would would a would a would a developer or applicant looking to seek, and then you have to determine well which board does this go to because there's as I there's two types of boards there's the planning board. And there's a zoning board of adjustment, and the zoning board of adjustment hears cases involving D variances. So, for example, to your question, if you're looking to put a commercial building in a residential zone, that use is not permitted in the zone. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you would the, the 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 zoning board of adjustment would have jurisdiction to hear that application. And the way that works is you would file an application a land use application before the zoning board. And they have to determine first whether they have jurisdiction under the municipal land use law. And if they do, then your application is reviewed. It's a deemed, it would have to be deemed administratively complete that you've complied with all the checklist requirements. 
Then you have to provide legal notice of your application to all property owners within 200 feet because the, the intent of the municipal land use law is to give not only the public a right to hear and object to an application, but also those individuals who live in close proximity to the proposed development. Mm -hmm. So you have to serve written legal notice and publish that notice in, a, in, in the local newspaper. And in this case, uh, under Gannett, it would be the home news if, we file, if we're looking okay. for one of the towns in, in Middlesex okay. County. Uh, the notice then is served on all those individuals, and then there's a hearing. And uh, the way the hearing works is it's, a, it, it's not quite a trial. It's a little less informal, but the role of the attorney is to bring expert witnesses to justify and support the relief that is sought. So that would be typically uh, on a development of, of a commercial development, for example, you would hire a civil engineer mm -hmm. you would hi who is licensed in the state of New Jersey and can testify as an expert. You would hire a professional planner someone who could testify as to the justification for the variance relief. And in this case, if it were devariance, they would have to justify its impact on the, on the surrounding properties and whether it's consistent with the master plan or intent of the zone plan. Uh, and then you could hire other experts. You could hire a traffic consultant, for example, if the board may be concerned about traffic issues parking issues, uh, uh, impact to local streets and roads. Uh, you could hire real estate experts who could testify. So again, it depends on the nature of what the relief and the application that you're seeking. And all of those experts would be qualified at a hearing. They'd be sworn in and they testify. And then there's a recording and transcript of that proceeding because ultimately, if there is an appeal to the court, uh, the court needs to see the written transcript so that they understand exactly what happened at the hearing. And then ultimately, your application is decided by the board, uh, and then they, they issue a, a written determination mm -hmm. um, in the form of a resolution. Now, this process is, is costly. So not only does the applicant, developer, whoever it is, have to pay for all of the expert witnesses. Except the attorney they don't pay for, right? Uh, the, <laughs> well, it, only if Jane's the client. Uh, but no, seriously. Yeah, they would pay for the attorney and all the experts. We want to see if anybody's still listening. That's yeah, right. I think, they, they just, I, think, I think there's 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 echoing in the well, back now. Morning. They're, drinking, <laughs> right. they're drinking the coffee. Right. I think, so I think the, lot, the sirens are going off. <laughs> um, and so then... Uh, but there's also application fees mm -hmm. for yeah. the application sure. to file with the town. And then they have escrow fees that the town requires. What is escrow fees? Well, that's for because the planning or zoning board hires their own professional consultants to review the, the nature of the application. So they will issue a written report typically to the board and, and to uh, the public, basically critiquing and assessing – what the relief is sought and the justifications that the applicant has to establish, and the applicant pays for all that, so they pay for the they they pay for the municipality's experts as well wow. as well. So the the you know the if it's a substantial development application, the cost for something like this could be you know into tens of thousands of dollars. Sure. So it's important, I guess, for the any anyone listening to understand that before you endeavor on a project like this. Understand the expense, the involvement of the process, and also do your due diligence. Meet with the town. Don't just assume that you file an application and they're going to approve it and it's a rubber stamp. It doesn't work that way. There's a, it's very involved and it, could t it and oftentimes can take several years before you can get through an application. Right. Um, it is very important to have right lawyer too. And I was sitting on East Brunswick zoning board for three years. I see time after time Mr. Himpleman represent the uh, the uh, application to come in, uh, to the board. I have to say I admire your work ethic. You always did so much research, even though your knowledge is so knowledgeable, but you still go above and beyond. And she told me this in, in private, too. So it's not, she's not just saying this because you're here. I can, I can attest to that. I can, I can vouch that she told me in private that you were the most prepared and knowledgeable of any of the, one, you know, definitely. The, yeah, on the one top, of the best top, attorneys. One of the best attorneys yeah. that she. Well, I, Jane and Ken, I really appreciate that. And I do think it's important uh, to be prepared. Yes. And to understand the issues. And a lot of 
a lot of attorneys, I think, in this particular area of the law, um, it's not only my, – my view has always been you not only have to be prepared, understand the issues, and, and present your application well, but I think it's also you have to have relationships with the community in which you are looking to represent clients. And the professional staff at the towns are very important. They play a vital role, and it's, it's important to meet with them, to discuss potential issues, because ultimately – they will also weigh in on a, on a particular application, and the and the board relies on that staff. So there's a process to this. There's a lot that goes on even before there is a public hearing. To your point, Jane. Yes. But you know, I I I think it. You're absolutely right. And one thing my mother always taught me, and she taught me this from day one in school: don't be the student when the, when when the professor calls on you and you have to and you raise your hand. You better understand and know the answer. <laughs> uh-huh. Don't just assume, right? Yes, absolutely. So, but the but the point is that there is a lot of preparation that goes in so, into this hearing process. So, I will sit down, I will prep my witnesses, I will do testimony outlines. We'll we'll have basically what's a dry run, and so that when we get to the hearing, it's organized. We present the case well, and I think that goes a long way in 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 in, in understanding from the planning or zoning board's perspective to, to really getting their arms around the issue. If it's, yeah. if it's detailed and it's presented in an organized fashion, the board can understand it. Mm-hmm. And so can the staff. Uh, oftentimes you see, you know, I've been in the audience waiting for my application to be heard and you could see that that always isn't the case. Yes, I know. And the I applicants are, tend to be a little confused and, and not always presenting the information correctly. And that does not bode well when you're trying to convince a board, to, uh, you know, particular planning or zoning board to act favorably upon your application. Before that, David, I have to say one thing, right? Because you're so knowledgeable and you're so honest, and when someone come to you, say, hey, I'm thinking about uh, doing this application, you always give them the right advice before they go with that. You will say, you know what? Right, you used to say, I most likely you have these issues, right? Most likely you're not gonna get approved because of this and that. So for that, I really applaud you. Well, and and I think that's an excellent point, Jane. And so it, it, you know, in the last 35 years I've been doing this, and I'm not saying this because uh, I'm trying to pat myself on the back, but I've had a lot more approvals before planning and zoning board than denials. Yes. And the reason for that is, in addition to the preparation and the research and being organized, Mm -hmm. is being able to judge and make a determination and a recommendation to a client before they even proceed with an application. Because I'm not looking to just take a client's uh, funding or money Mm -hmm. just for the sake of doing that. I want the client to be successful. Yes. Okay? So I look at it as though... It's hand in glove. I'm representing a particular client, but at the end, it's my reputation also that's on the line. And also, I don't want the client to feel as though they didn't get the right advice. Yes, absolutely. So oftentimes what I do is I will meet with the town. Mm -hmm. I will speak to people. I will analyze and assess whether this is something that has viability. Mm -hmm. And also you have to be concerned, will there be objectors to this? Mm -hmm. What were the objectors? What will the objectors raise? What points will they Will they make? And you know, listen. The members of the of the zoning and planning board, they're volunteers. Yes. They live in the yep. community. And the residents show up. And, and the get, residents and show they, up. And the board is going to be sensitive to those yes. complaints or those objectives. And you have to be prepared to address those. So oftentimes, I've had situations before we even filed an application. I'll often meet with the residents mm-hmm. that are surrounding wow. the particular project, and listen to them and understand what their concerns might be. Because then my engineer, my planner, my traffic consultant, my other experts can weigh in and respond to those before we even get to a hearing. Mm-hmm. So it gives yeah. the residents a sense, hey, you know, they're, they're out here, they're, they're meeting with us before they even file an application. And I guess they're serious, so we're willing to listen. Yes. And that's important. Uh, and, yeah. and I think the board and the professional staff respect that. Yes, absolutely. Right. In about one minute, David, we're out of time. Yes. And let's say that you lose, the zoning board denies the application. On what grounds can you appeal it to the court? Because isn't it, it I thought it's basically a factual determination that it's not in the best interest of the townships so and the board can vote. Let's say they deny 
they deny it and the appeal process, what would the court look at in-, in Well, uh, the, the court's going to look at, Ken, uh, first of all, you would file what's called a, a prerogative writ complaint. Basically, the court's going to rely on the record below. There's no new the test- factual, right. factual and legal. Right. There's no- So on the legal end, the, the court's going to look at, was the board's decision arbitrary and capricious? Okay. Based on the, based on the record below- did the, did, the, did the planning or zoning board, as the case might be, did they make a reasonable determination based on the facts? Was there s- sufficient expert testimony presented? And the other issue is, and there's been some recent cases on this, uh, did the board proffer their own experts? Did they look to contradict what the applicant's experts are offering? And sometimes the board doesn't do that. So if the applicant presents a case and the professional staff uh, or, or experts do not contradict that, the, board, the court's going to look at that and say, wait a minute, then if you didn't have any uh, contradictory evidence, maybe the board did act reason, uh, unreasonable. Okay. All good stuff. Yeah. We're out of time. Yeah. Uh, once again, please give the uh, audience your telephone number yes. if they want to reach out to you. So my yeah. telephone number is 732-659-6130. And again, my office is uh, in, in East Brunswick on Cranberry Road. And thank you. Thank Jane you. and Ken and thank for you. radio hosting, and I appreciate it. Wow, thank you so much. That was quite informative. We got to go. We're out of time. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.